This video will explain the Evolved Transformer. This model has recently become more popular because of its contribution to the MENA bot, one of the most impressive open domain chatbots to date. This video is intended to get a better sense of this underlying Evolved Transformer model and present the details for how they search for Transformer models, how they encode Transformers in the genetic space to enable automated search through evolutionary search, and some details behind what makes searching for Transformers more challenging than most of neural architecture search, which is looking at searching for convolutional networks for ImageNet classification. This video will explain the Evolved Transformer. This paper explores neural architecture search for transformer models. This involves searching for a transformation pathway using self-attention layers, convolutions, layer normalizations, and more. This video will cover how the encoding space for transformers is designed, the details of their evolution search and their progressive dynamic hurdles technique, as well as the challenges of doing neural architecture search with transformers on sequence-to-sequence -sequence tasks like neural machine translation, and how this differs from more heavily studied techniques like designing convolutional networks for image net classification. Evolutionary algorithms work by modifying genetic codes corresponding to individuals in the population. One of the most important characteristics of neural architecture search algorithms is how the search space encodes the architectures because naturally it biases the architectures that result from it. The evolved transformer targets a branching structure where a hidden state input is modified by a left and a right branch. The resulting encoding has five dimensions for the left and right branches, input, normalization, layer, relative output dimension, and activation. The genetic code has six of these blocks for the encoder and then eight of these blocks for the decoder. If you remember that this transformer, it has this encoder decoder like structure for sequence to sequence tasks. Additionally, the genetic code determines how many times to repeat the block denoted as number of cells with one value for the encoder and one value for the decoder. The genetic code produces encoder and decoder blocks. These blocks are then stacked on top of each other in order to make up the overall transformer architecture. This image is an example of the final encoder block found by the evolved transformer search, and this is an example of the decoder block. You can see from the blocks the evidence of the left and right branching structure that manifests itself in the final evolution and the final uh, transformer encoder and decoder blocks. Following this slide, we'll look at exactly how you would encode for the original transformer architecture given this genetic coding search space. Now we'll look at how you might encode the transformer in this genetic coding space. So remember that the genetic code is made up of the left branch and the right branch. So I've separated the, uh, like the illustration of the encoding as this top line denotes the left branch and then this line denotes the uh, right branch and then the addition is the combiner function that combines these two branches. So on the left side we have the input is zero because we're on the first level of the transformer and there's really no decision to be made here. You just take zero meaning the uh, baseline input to the block. So then we choose the layer normalization between normalization or no normalization then for our layer, we select the eight head self attention layer, and it's, you can't really tell what the relative output dimension is from this diagram, so I've just let it, left a dash here. And then we have no activation for the ending of the left branch. So in the right branch, we take in zero as the input. We don't pass it through any normalization, but we use an identity connection to propagate it to head forward, and then again, a dash for the output dimension, and then we see that there's no activation applied to this identity projection. So then we use addition to combine the left and the right branches to make up the first kind of component of this encoder block. Moving up one level in the transformer is a little harder to just immediately see how this is encoded. But we see on the left branch, we take one, meaning we take this previous hidden state as the input to the left branch. Then we pass it through layer normalization. Then for our layer, we select a one by one convolution. And it looks like what we do is we select four for the relative output dimension because this is four times larger than the previous 512 uh, number of uh, features in the previous cell. Then we pass it through the ReLU activation, and it looks like what happens on the right branch is we select the dead branch uh, layer. So it, I put dashes here because you can't tell what input uh, normalization or output or activation might be encoded here if it selects dead branch because from this diagram you can't really uh, make up that detail. And then also you see that they have no combiner function because it's a dead branch, so there's no need to combine the left and right branches. Stepping up another level of the transformer, we take in two as the input of the hidden state to the left branch of the next cell. Then we take in none as the normalization, as we see this doesn't go through any normalization. We select a one by one convolution layer, and I've chosen to omit trying to figure out what's going on with the relative output dimension, and then we see that there is no activation after this layer. In the right branch, what we do is we take one as the previous input. So one is a previous hidden state in the block that we take as input to go through an identity mapping, and then we combine the left and the right branch through this addition combiner function. Now we'll walk through the genetic encoding of the final evolved transformer encoder block. This is the encoder block that results as the final product of this search. 
And I think that it's important to walk through it again, because I think that this is really the core idea of this paper is understanding how they structure the search space and like kind of how this corresponds to resulting architectures. So as we start to do the evolved transformer search, we start to develop this left and right branching structures in the final architectures, which you'll see even more in the decoder block because we seed this search with the transformer model that doesn't have this kind of a left and right branch architecture. Rather, what we're really just doing is encoding these identity connections with the right branches. So we see with the evolved transformer, we start off with the zero input because we're on the first level. We take in the layer normalization, pass it through this gated linear unit, and then we have on the right branch this identity connection to head one. Then in the next step, we start to see this branching structure. This branching structure is encoded as taking the one as the hidden uh, input state for the uh, left branch, and then passing it through a one by one convolution, modifying the relative output dimension on both sides, then passing it through a ReLU activation, and then combining both sides of the branch with this addition combiner function. Then stepping up one level higher, we take in the uh, previous hidden state, the two, then we pass it through layer normalization, a separable convolution, and then we see on the right branch how we take back the uh, identity connection, but from a previous hidden state. So we see how it uh, propagates all the way back from this first hidden state using this identity connection into this kind of a uh, component within the encoder block. From their research paper, the Evolve Transformer, you can see more details about each of these different dimensions that's encoded for each of these blocks in the genetic encoding. So from the input, it selects the hidden state up to where it currently is. So it has the choice of zero up to I. So say when we're on that example of being at the second layer, we can kind of uh, take the one as the hidden st cell state that we saw, or we can take two. So then we see the normalization layer. Here you can either just select to do layer normalization, which is described in this paper, or just have no normalization. Then we see all the different layers that the Evolve Transformer can choose between. It can choose these standard convolutions, these depth-wise separable convolutions, or it can do things like the H-head attention, or in the decoder it can choose to attend to the encoder's representation. So this is a really interesting uh, component of the search space is the layers that are available for the model to choose between. Then we have the relative output dimension, which is choosing how we're uh, like shrinking and expanding the uh, number of feature maps and the uh, embedding depth within the transformer. Then we have the activation function, like the swish, the ReLU, leaky ReLU, or no activation. And we have the combiner that combines the left and the right branches to form these blocks. We also have the number of cells, which is the number of times to repeat this block at each kind of a step as you're stacking these blocks on top of each other to form the overall transformer. They begin their search at a smaller scale and show the impact of certain mutations on the resulting perplexity of the transformer when it's trained on this neural machine translation task. You see certain mutations like deciding to uh, repeat the number of cells in the decoder three times up to four times results in a very large decrease in the uh, perplexity, which is a metric where lower is better. And you also see how certain mutations like replacing the eight head attention with a gated linear unit increases the perplexity. So it's interesting to see this ablation of how the different mutations within the genetic code resulting in transformers affects the uh, resulting performance of the model. This slide is intended to highlight some of the differences between the evolved transformer blocks and the original transformer encoder and decoder blocks. So we see that the uh, evolved transformer uses these wide uh, depth-wise separable convolutions in the lower layers of the encoder and decoder blocks compared to how the transformer architecture is structured. And we also see these branching uh, structures, which are probably a result of the encoding space. So it's definitely interesting to see the difference between the evolved transformer encoder and the uh, original transformer, whereas they are pretty similar towards the ending. Almost, a, I think they actually are exactly similar at the ending of it, as well as in the decoder blocks, but they differ in the early ways that they process the input. So it's interesting to see the structure that results from the search. And it's also worth mentioning that they start the evolution search by seeding it with this transformer architecture. So now we'll look at some of the results comparing the evolved transformer with the original transformer architecture. We see that the evolved transformer outperforms the original transformer, especially at this mid scale of the parameter count, although it tends to saturate towards the end. But we see that the evolved transformer is more parameter efficient than the base transformer is. And then as we look through uh, more uh, data on the results of these models, we just see the evolved transformer outperform the original transformer on this metric of perplexity, where lower is better, and then on blue, which is a metric where higher is better. So then we see, again, just a comparison of the evolved transformer compared to previous manual designs of the transformer. So similar to how the neural architecture search on the ImageNet classification literature would look something like uh, VGG16 or like dense nets up to res nets and these different kinds of manual designs, and then it would show you something like amoeba net or the NASNet outperforms it. This is a similar kind of comparison where they're showing you like, uh, this is the original transformer paper up to further designs, manual designs of the transformer, and then showing how automated search is able to surpass the scores of these previous manually designed architectures. Now we'll look at the evolutionary search component of this neural architecture search. 
Evolutionary search has this structure of beginning with an initialization. In this case, we're initializing our search with this transformer architecture. Then we evaluate our models by training them and then having a fitness function, in this case being the perplexity metric on the held out validation set. Then we do crossover and mutation to form new models. But I think in this search, we're just doing mutation. So some of the details of their original search, they start off to test it with a population size of 100, subpopulation sizes of 30 to either be eliminated from the population or to uh, do the mutation on. And the mutations, as the mutation is parsing through the genetic code, it will mutate it at a rate of 2.5%. One of the biggest bottlenecks with neural architecture search is that you then have to train the child network in order to get the fitness function. So this diagram shows the reinforcement learning search where you have the controller and then you sample the architecture, but then you have this huge bottleneck that's also evident in this evolution of transformers where you have to train the resulting transformer model. So they describe some of the computational demands of doing this kind of transformer search. So in these uh, convolutional network searches like AmoebaNet, they train the child networks on the CIFAR10 proxy task for ImageNet. So they don't train the child networks directly on ImageNet because it would take too long. Rather, they just do the CIFAR10, which is a smaller data set, a lower resolution input, and it's an easier thing to train the models on. So unlike CIFAR10, they can't find a good uh, proxy task for this uh, neural machine translation task. So they are going to be training on their final task. And this requires about 10 hours of training to evaluate each of the child models compared to two hours on their previous studies with the CIFAR-10 data set. One way they overcome the obstacle of a computationally demanding evaluation is by introducing this technique of progressive dynamic hurdles. So basically what they do is they stop the training of the populations at a certain interval, denoted as these uh, arrays of S sub 0, S sub 1, S sub 2, which is basically these vectors of the training step increments. So once they reach a training step uh, increment, they stop it and then they get the median fitness of the population and then they basically uh, just truncate the search by only allowing the training to proceed on the models that are higher than the mean fitness. And then it'll step into the next uh, number of training steps to do until you do this again. And you repeat this. So a similar algorithm to uh, things like hyperband, where you have this kind of a resource allocation technique to make sure that you aren't wasting computation on non-promising models. This table shows the ablation of the different search techniques. So you see that seeding the model with the transformer architecture compared to just having a random encoding to start off the search results in a much better model. Then you can also see from this table that the progressive dynamic hurdling results in a better performing model than just having a uniform training step for each model while simultaneously keeping the budget uh, constrained. So you don't really uh, get to train as many models when you do this 180K training steps compared to 15K or 30K or the progressive dynamic hurdling. So one interesting characteristic of these neural architecture searches that introduce things like uh, this kind of early stopping evaluation where you stop the models after 30 training steps and then cut off all the ones that haven't uh, done that well yet is that you might result in models that just train quickly compared to finding the overall best architecture. So it's one interesting thing to consider with respect to the way that this search is designed. So after performing this ablation, they scale up the size of their search by doing 5,000 models per hurdle uh, increasing the step count, lowering the mutation rate, and then they switch the none value to normalization. So they always have to have a normalization mutation. So they don't have uh, no normalization layers at before transformations. Then the search runs for 15,000 child models. And then in the first hurdle, 13,000 of these models are removed. So overall, the search does 979 million training steps. And then they select the top 20 models and train them for an additional 300,000 steps. The Evolved Transformer is an interesting study that hasn't been, is the first kind of line of research where we're looking at these neural architecture searches, automated search on the transformer architectures. So one thing they denote is why do they choose evolutionary search compared to reinforcement learning or differentiable search like the DARTS algorithm. So they discuss how it's hard to warm start some of these methods like reinforcement learning. It would be hard to seed the reinforcement learning controller to initially design transformer models. Then they discuss how evolution is more efficient than reinforcement learning search with limited resources. And then they discuss how DARTS having this uh, differentiability on the edges of this massive model would require too much memory at the model sizes that they're searching for because they're training directly on the neural machine translation task. And this kind of transformer, it's a pretty uh, heavy memory bottleneck with respect to these architectures. So it's tough to do something like differentiable search in that space. And then they also point to the success of the amoeba net, the evolution of image classifier architecture that performs really well with a similar kind of algorithm. So again, they're optimizing for the best architecture over the best search efficiency. And it's definitely uh, an early area of research, especially with the new uh, advancement in the chatbot success. They'll probably start exploring neural architecture search in the transformer space more and more and develop more efficient searches, as well as design new ways of structuring the search space. 
Thanks for watching this explanation of the Evolve Transformer. I hope from this video you were able to understand how they do the genetic encoding that results in the production of these encoder and decoder blocks in the Evolve Transformer. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.